Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Jamie Hughes Show. My name as always is Jamie Hughes and today I'm going to be giving you my review of Game of Thrones Season 8 Episode 6, the last episode ever which was entitled The Iron Throne. Now if you want to keep up to date with all the latest movie news and reviews then make sure you hit that subscribe button and as always my Game of Thrones videos this review will include spoilers so you have now been warned. So Game of Thrones is over, my heart is sad and I felt like the season eight finale delivered stuff. It was it wasn't terrible, but it wasn't amazing either. I mean a lot of stuff happened, but at the same time it didn't really feel like a lot went on either. It all felt like it was going the way it was supposed to go. I don't want to say it was predictable, but part of me was just holding out that there was gonna be, you know, one more big surprise to finish the series off with a bang. But I think what we got as an episode of the, as a whole was very, very good. Um, we got a lot of kind of, well, we got all of the stories pretty much wrapped up in a nice bow in one way, shape or form. So let's jump in to the episode. And we started things off with Tyrion walking through the streets of King's Landing and he goes to um, the Red Keep. He, he goes down into, I, I don't know if it's a crypt, but like the, the basement of the Red Keep, I guess. And that is where he discovers that Cersei and Jaime didn't escape. And, you know, he finds his brother and his sister's bodies. And I thought this was a great scene. It was, it was just one of those really nice things. And what was great about this whole segment that we got is that there was no music at all. And it was just definitely silent and I think that works so well and added to to Tyrion's heartbreak because Tyrion overall has been such a very strong character we've very rarely seen him have moments of full emotion or shown him in positions of I don't want to say weakness but emotional weakness is guess is, is what I'm getting at here and I thought you know, him discovering Jamie and Cersei's body. We saw him grieve for Jamie, the brother that he loved so much. We saw him grieve for Cersei's unborn baby. And I believe in that moment as well is that he was almost grieving for Cersei in the way in which she had gone out. And I like this little scene, just as I mentioned. I just want to mention it really quick because, you know, I, I did like this as a, a little bit of an opener to this episode. We then had tension between John and Grey Worm, which led to Daenerys speaking out to the Unsullied and the Dothraki armies. We got this amazing shot, bloody hell, set me on fire and call me Varys. That shot of Daenerys when she gets off Drogon and he takes off behind her and you just see that almost silhouetted figure of Daenerys and, you know, Drogon's wings behind her it looked amazing. She's like, are you with me, lads? Like, are we going to go and break the wheel? You know, we've started here in King's Landing, but there are so many other realms we can go and liberate um which leads to Daenerys and Tyrion getting into it Tyrion throws away and discards his role as Hand of the King he is then taken captive by Grey Worm and Daenerys Arya shows up and says to Jon like you know what are you doing here Jon like she is she's the mad queen like we're not going to bend the knee to her something needs to be done to stop her which then leads to a meeting between Jon and Tyrion Tyrion says you know I was behind her, as you were, you know, we were all behind her, but Varys was right, Varys saw something in her that we didn't, and now we have to essentially put a stop to Daenerys, you know, I'm not going to be the last man that she kills, you know, John, you have a, a cast iron, if you'll pardon the pun, right to the Iron Throne, you, you know, she's always going to have that in the back of her mind, you could very well be next, and if your sisters don't bend the knee, then they will be next as well, and I think that that is kind of where John realizes what he has to do and he goes into the throne room. We get kind of the culmination of Daenerys' vision in season two or three, I think it is, where she's in the throne room, but this time she actually touches the throne. A little bit of poetic justice that she never actually gets to sit on it because John comes in, they have um, a conversation where Daenerys reveals that she can't count to 20, which is quite fun. You know, John says, you are my queen forever and always. They share a kiss. And, I, and genuinely, this was quite nice because I was sitting there going, oh, well, John's not going to be the one to kill her now. Or like, I, I, I was thinking like, John's not going to do it now. It's going to take something else to like break John to the point where he has to kill Khaleesi. But no, whoosh, straight in the heart he stabs her with a dagger and Khaleesi is dead I like this and I didn't like it at the same time because it kind of dispels that are you thing of you know she was supposed to kill green eyes and now you know John has killed her and that prophecy kind of gets 
thrown to the side. Um, but I liked it because, you know, it was... It felt like it was John's duty to kill Daenerys, and, and he did it, and I think he did it in a, a, the nicest way possible. If you can stab somebody in the nicest way possible, I don't know, but it, it, it worked for me. I think there was other ways it could have gone, and there was other ways I saw it going, but I think what we got um, worked well in a storyline sense. We then saw Drogon go like, well, he lost his head, he was fuming because John had killed Daenerys, you know, he gives her a little knock. And it looks like he's gonna burn John. And me and my mates in work have been talking about this. We were like, oh, like John's, like D Drogon's gonna burn John, and John is just gonna be there, like bollock naked. He's not gonna be burned by the flames. But no, he actually turns and he burns the Iron Throne. And he just gets rid of the Iron Throne. And I really like this. And it's weird to say that this was some really great character work from Drogon because he realized that, you know, it wasn't John that killed Daenerys. It was the Iron Throne that essentially killed Daenerys. It was that whole concept of, of, of a, being a leader and being a ruler. That is what killed Daenerys because she would never be able to rest while she sat on the Iron Throne. So he just gets rid of it. And I like this. Again, I like this. It, it felt very kind of very Game of Thronesy, and the fact that the dragon took out the throne worked well. What I didn't like is that he just picked her up and flew away with her. Like, it was just, like, really weird. It, it just felt odd, and that was, like, the last thing we saw of Daenerys. You know, we could have seen a shot of her, you know, of Drogon burning the throne with her in the foreground, but no, he, he just boop, picked her up and, and flew away, which, I don't know, is there something more to that? Um, that I'm missing is he going to take her away somewhere and give her a proper burial maybe but like just the last shot of Daenerys being her being like flopped around in a dragon claw just felt a little bit odd and didn't I don't know it didn't feel right for the character if I'm being honest. So we then moved outside of King's Landing where we had all of the remaining kind of secondary characters and main characters as well the lords and ladies of Westeros. Um, we had Tyrion there, who was brought there by Grey Worm. Grey Worm is fuming because Jon is um, a prisoner for what he did to Daenerys. They kind of all sit there and say, well, we need a new king or queen. Sam pops up and says, well, why don't we let the people decide? Let's, let's let everybody decide because whoever is ruling will be ruling everyone. It's kind of last off, but they go with the, the notion of, well, why don't we decide? You know, it, it could be one of us here. Where Tyrion then steps forward and says, well, we need somebody that's got, a, a, you know, a story, has shown strength, has shown courage. Uh, and he points towards Bran. He calls him Bran the Broken. Not really sure how I feel about that name. Surely, like, they, they could have come up with something else. But still, he's Bran the Broken. And he says, you know, he is the Three-Eyed Raven. He knows our past. So who else is better to lead us in to the future? It's kind of, they all... The general consensus is, yes, we agree. So Bran then becomes the king of the seven kingdoms, or should I say, the king of the six kingdoms, because it comes to Sansa and she says, Bran, you'll be a good king. However, I think the North should stay an independent kingdom. We've worked too hard. We've lost too much. We can't go back to being ruled by somebody in the South. So, you know, kind of let me keep it. Bran's fine with that. He's already said he doesn't want the position of king, but he's been thrust upon it. So, you know, having that tie with Sansa in the North, it keeps it in the family. So he's cool with that and it, it worked fine. And I really like this. Again, it was one of those things that it could have gone so many different ways at this point. But I think having Bran definitely works and it works um because i think you know i think it's alluded to in in maybe season four or season six that the last three-eyed raven was over a thousand years old so Tyrion has played the long game here and he's entrusting that bran you know will live for a thousand years meaning bran can rule for a thousand years which means we possibly could see a conflict flee uh, conflict free world for you know, thousands of years. So I think Tyrion was very, very smart in what he did there. Um, and Bran has just been a lad, and he? he's played proper played the long game here. You know, he, he fell out the window, he became the Free-Eyed Raven, and then for about two or three seasons, he hasn't really done that much of significance. You know, he's walked about a bit, he's let all his friends die, he's let his enemies die, and boom, he's ended up on the Iron Throne. That's what I like. It's like that thing when you're in school and you're in a group project and nobody does any work and then takes all the credit for it at the end. That is what Bran and Stark has just done here in Game of Thrones. But again, I liked it. It worked. You know, it wasn't spectacular, but it works. So to move a little bit forward, we then got all of the secondary characters wrapped up in Game of Thrones, and most of them have ended up 
as kind of Bran's advisors and they're on like the king's court. So you have Tyrion who is the hand of the king, you have Sir Davos who is master of ships, you have um, Sam who becomes Grand Maester of King's Landing, you have Brienne who is commander of the King's Guard. I think we see that Podrick is now is also a knight. He was wheeling Bran about in that scene. And then Bronn Bron just knocks up and he's now master of coin. He's, his debts have been paid. I think that's alluded to that, you know, he's master of coin. He's got high garden. I think he gets a couple of other things and he says he's my debt paid. So yeah, it wrapped up all of the secondary characters quite nicely. It's nice that they've all stayed in King's Landing and together I think that, you know, that they all kind of have the right characteristics, maybe not Bronn to an extent, but they have the right characteristics and they've kind of fit into where I suppose the story has been leading for them. So that was quite nice that we got a conclusion to um, all of the secondary characters. Was it a bit convenient that they all stayed together? Yes, but again, for me, it worked because it felt right within a storyline sense. So then we then saw Tyrion sentence Jon to go back to the wall. He says, you can't be killed and you also can't be set free because it will start a war. So he says, we've decided everybody's happy with the punishment. You're going to go back to the wall. And I like this because what it did is it almost made Jon's story come full circle. He was a bastard in Winterfell. He went to the wall. He was then king of the north. He then became, almost became king of the seven kingdoms. And now he's going back to the wall. I like this. It wrapped it up very nicely. And it's nice to see Jon's story come full circle. Yes, it may not be what people wanted, but it worked. Again, it worked for me. Um, and then we got this really nice kind of montage of all three Starks building and going their separate ways. We saw Jon go into the wall. We saw Sansa going and rule in Winterfell. And then we saw Arya who says that she is not going back to Winterfell. She's not staying in King's Landing either. She's going to go on an adventure, I guess. And she's going to go west of Westeros. And when she kind of first said this, I was kind of I was just like, it doesn't work. It doesn't fit Arya's character because for so long she's always been a prisoner and it felt like maybe she could have gone back to Bravos, and um, maybe she could have stayed in King's Landing. It felt a little bit out of character, but then I suppose in a sense she has always had that sense of adventure about her and then it clicked as she was sailing away with the Stark's banners on her little bow. It clicked and obviously this is setting up, or I would like to think it's going to set up an Arya spin-off series in the future because the way it was left open, it was never really said where she was going. I think that's what they were alluding to. So, you know, if we're gonna get an Arya spin-off from this, then um, it works for me, I guess. I, I, I liked it. And as I say, that's kind of the whole consensus for me of this episode is that stuff worked yes it wasn't groundbreaking yes it wasn't over the top amazing spectacular but it wasn't terrible either i felt like a lot of what the characters did those decisions were kind of within character for them and where they ended up was more or less the right places. As I say, we got that great moment with John as he gets to the wall. Tormund is still there, so we see John ride north. Um, I think it goes back to something that he said in episode three where he says, you know, you've got the north and you the real north. So John kind of escapes the wall with the free folk and that is it, the last shot of Game of Thrones, is actually very similar to the first shot where we see two characters come out of the wall and head north of the wall, but obviously now there is no threat of the dead. And yeah, it was, it was, I felt for me, it was a satisfying ending to Game of Thrones. We got stories wrapped up. Um, I'm still a little bit goyed. We didn't get like a shocking Night King return, but obviously that is being held now, I would think, for the Long Night spin-off series. And look, this, this series has had issues. It's been rushed. It definitely could have done with a few episodes more, but I enjoyed it. I think overall, Game of Thrones will cement itself as one of the greatest epic fantasy series in TV history. Yes, things haven't gone the way that we thought, but I think as a single entity episode conclusion to this 10 year story, it felt fine. It felt satisfying to a degree. 
and yeah i enjoyed it i liked it it's it's a shame that it's finished but i suppose we've got a load of prequels and a load of spin-offs to come now to get us excited as well so let me know your thoughts about the iron throne the last ever episode of game of thrones let me know what you thought as always down in those comments below and if you did enjoy this episode of the jamie hughes show and you want to keep up to date with all the latest movie news and reviews then make sure you hit that subscribe button and i will see you in the very next episode of the jamie hughes show ta -ra.